Hi, how are you? Um, I was a little distracted with other internal things here. <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, I can present her. I think there was a, um, a mistake. I think that you were presenting her, but... Uh, I'm happy with whoever wants to be here. <laughs> Honored to be here. Well, in oh, no, Nazi, go ahead then. <laughs> okay, no, no, because in, in, in the chat we were commenting this. So uh, yes, let's, yes. let's. I think the chat was a little oh, mistaken. Okay, so yeah. thank you. So, Athena, um, thank you for being with us. Uh, Athena Papadopoulou uh, has, uh, from my point of view, an impressive uh, reference. Uh, because we have somebody from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with us. Uh, from my point of view, uh, MIT is something like, like the reference, you know, so the best projects uh, and the best research uh, is coming from, from the institution that, that you are working with. And it's something very, very interesting uh, to have you here. So. Athena, in order to, to introduce her, is an assistant professor of architecture. She's PhD um, and he's lecturing about health and design at the New York Institute of Technology. And her research uh, focuses on programmable material environments uh, that uh, are enhancing health through sensory interaction. No? So we, we have been, um, Session by session, we, we are interacting um, with one, it's one step that is more and more technological. No? So she received her PhD in design computation from MIT, and she registered architect in the U. Um, by, the, by, by her name, I could uh, guess that she's from Greece, and she is the founder of Affective uh, matter incorporated so the floor is yours athena and thank you for being with us thank you so much ignacy first of all thank you for pronouncing my name my last name right yes uh, okay. here in the u.s uh, most people don't <laughs> uh, so i appreciate that and also yes thank you of course mit is amazing but now i'm in uh, my new role at nyt as an assistant professor so we also do their uh, amazing stuff in the health and design program and uh Actually, I'm, um, as I'm going to, some of the projects I'm going to show are um, started at MIT, where I had the role as a PhD researcher, and now I'm continuing there um, at our new health and design program, and also, um, you know, through teaching um, in the graduate and undergraduate program. So let me just share my um, screen. Great. So um, I'm going to um, appreciate a lot the talks of the previous speakers about sustainability and materials. Um, as in Nancy, you mentioned, like now my talk, talk will be a little bit more technological, but also uh, bringing the perspective of more of the embodied scale and the, what I call like human material interaction um, for the benefit of, of well being. And I'm addressing um, so needs with people with physical and mental disabilities through making these new uh, human material systems and through computation uh, uh, tools and pedagogical uh, methods. So in my work, I explore how we can augment, substitute, or enhance our interactions with matter in order to create environments and objects that enrich our experiences and support individuals with sensory, physical, and, and mental uh, disabilities. So I'm gonna uh, start a little bit by uh, showing some of the, um, as a background research of my work uh, that I did at MIT, at the MIT Self-Assembly Lab, that was, uh, it's still directed by Professor Skylar Tibbetts. And I worked there as a researcher for, um, for some time until I entered my uh, PhD uh, program. And there the work we did uh, kind of influenced my uh, further um, kind of research investigations. So there we uh, did uh, programmable materials, uh, which is like using 3D printing, lamination, uh, art there techniques. We created composite materials that respond to the environment by changing, uh, by changing shape, uh, either because of temperature or moisture. And uh, we would use custom, wood gra custom grain, printed grain to, to make, for example, here wood uh, transform in predictable ways. Um, that was in the smaller scale, in larger scale, we would use uh, 
uh, oh, um, products that uh, self-transform. This is in Milan Furniture Fair. And then um, in a more embodied scale, that's a project I led on exotic materials. Um, and we were looking at how uh, materials can be like a second layer, like a skin that can respond to the weather in a way that our human skin kind of responds opening and closing the pores, right? Um, so, so having done this research, and I was very excited working with, uh, and I'm still am working with materials, and another actually, actually direction of um, materials we do, um, and with uh, colleagues of mine do at NYT is working in, um, um, you know, sustainable uh, materials, regenerative materials, and so on. Uh, for example, Professor Pongratz works on that, and I have uh, worked a lot in programmable materials and environmental interaction, but like um, now talking about the embodied scale, I was interested in how um, how we can uh, program materials environment to actually respond to our bodies in order to act therapeutically, because I was always interested in the sensorial aspect and um, human aspect in, in architecture, the experiential aspect. And I thought that taking advantage of the advanced material technologies that uh, exist now and that one we can develop, we can create new um, advanced human material as systems for health. So, uh, but, but behind this kind of technological proposition, there's like a very simple truth, which is uh, that our environments affect uh, our health and uh, well-being in our everyday lives. Like, so um, people have been like walking, um, taking walks in nature or uh, to kind of uplift their mood and clear their mind. This is a, a park close to uh, my home here in uh, Queens. Um, but also um, they have been taking advantage of therapeutic sensory pro properties of the environment, like temperature or light or heat. So taking some, doing some bathing on the beach or taking therapeutic warm uh, baths. Um, so so it's heliotherapy ileo or hydrotherapy, something like ancient uh, traditions like in, in, in Europe have introduced and uh, Egypt and elsewhere. So, um, and that's not of course only natural environments that uh, affect uh, our health. It's also the environments we design. And um, of course, um, um, this is uh, one of P Peter Sunter's uh, uh, work. He's, he's very he's very much uh, exper experiential and tutorial. Uh, most great architects would agree that architecture is a lot to great extent about experience. So texture, materiality, lighting, sound, all affect our, our mood and health. So I came up, um, and, uh, and that's like starting in my uh, research at, at, at MIT, I came up with this idea of developing wearable environments. Um, the, the idea of a minimum case of, a, of an environment uh, that can respond to our body for the purpose of health. So it was kind of a proof of concept of my uh, idea of like human material interaction through um, responding uh, responsive environments. Um, and so the the, pro the problem I, I, I designed to um, to tackle is um, emotion regulation, meaning um, um, how we can um, kind of manage our, our emotions uh, better, like particular that's an aspect in uh, struggling with individuals with anxiety, uh, mental disorders, mental health disorders like depression, but also individuals with trauma and developmental disorders, um, uh, autism and so on. Um, so, so emotions are not only um, cognitive state. Uh, emotions are a great part of them is uh, are embodied physical sensations. Like for example, when we are stressed, we feel butterflies in the stomach, or we might feel uh, our heart racing, um, and so on. When we are in love, we might feel like an openness in the chest. So all these kind of uh, real tangible embodied ways of feeling emotions. And and but we we are not always aware of what these embodied feelings are. Sometimes we wonder if this uh, are we feeling butterflies in my stomach because I'm 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 um, I'm stressed, or because I'm hungry, or because uh, this or that. So um, there's not always a good communication between our brain and our, our and our mind because emotions can be uh, very deeply rooted in our unconscious brain and um, not, not always surface in uncognitive awareness. And and but nevertheless, even though we don't realize why we feel this way or another, uh, emotions find their way in their body and express uh, in all these kind of physiological sensations. And this, this connection between the mind and brain is, as I said, very evident to people who had 
have developmental uh, mental disorders, sensory processing disorders, and so on. So, um, so for my research, I came up with a, a system uh, that called affective matter, uh, defined as a haptic material modality for emotion regulation and communication. The, the idea behind that is that, so why don't we take like what is uh, hidden and not seen in our emotion communication, which is the physiological aspect of emotion, and use that to, um, to kind of restore this communication between our brain uh, and our mind in kind of in a in a self-regulation mode by um and by having materials responding to physiological signals through uh, material actuation and transformation that could produce haptic feedback in the form of warmth and pressure and 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 or use this material uh, as a medium for communication with others in a in a non-verbal way. And as we know, for example, many individuals uh, on the spectrum and, and with other disorders, they might be non-verbal. So like uh, some individuals cannot even, not, not just be aware of the emotions, they cannot even talk talk about them. So the idea is to create a material as a medium, uh, uh, material, material mediated affective communication. Um, and so how this um, works is that by responding to physiological signals of the body uh, through haptic feedback, Materials can adjust our bodily rhythms, uh, having an impact on our affective states. Let me explain what I mean by that. Is that I created materials that, uh, the way in the way they respond to the body, they 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 um uh, they were programmed based on our breathing rate and other uh, rhythmic uh, aspects of the body, and and by uh, synchronizing our body with the materials, um, we would uh, affect our bodily rhythms in. Um, increasing or decreasing them and by affecting for example breathing rate we affect the heart rate and we activate the parasympathetic system to kind of promote relaxation or on the other end to promote more uh, excitation um so and and the way and how this works or why this works um the background behind it is again very simple and it's uh, something we do in everyday lives it's a principle called like interpersonal synchrony or else entrainment process in sciences. So we tend to synchronize the rhythms of our bodies with the rhythms of environments when we do in rituals like dancing or um, um, ceremonies or like, so we, we synchronize our body with the other or we synchronize our bodies with the tempo of the rhythm of the music, but also when we're infants, we synchronize our breathing and heart rate with that of our mothers, for example. And we, um, and, uh, Research has shown that this uh, interpersonal synchrony creates a uh, bonding and, and empathy. Um, and so, so for me, I, 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 I took advantage of this synchronization, but it's, it's not only between humans, it's also like we synchronize with the uh, circadian rhythms, with the cycles of um, day and night and so on. And so um, I created a material that can create this kind of rhythm through the actuation. Uh, so these are um this is an effective sleeve a sleeve um made of uh oh i'm sorry so safe memory are alloys uh, that are embedded through fabrics and so when uh, uh curing passes through the wires this changes shape slowly um producing this different shape on each of the sleeve cap and inducing a slight uh, pressure sensation. At the same time, when curing passes through the wire, um, it warms up and that produces uh, also the warmth sensation. So warmth and uh, pressure are uh, two aspects of haptic sensation um, that I thought would be benef beneficial because deep, uh, because that has been also proven to kind of have to have an impact on anxiety, um, reducing anxiety and, and depression. So um, so we, uh, together with a collaborator at MIT, uh, Jackie Berry, when she was also a research, a research student there, um, we conducted a study to, so, to see if uh, slow and fast rhythmic haptic action of the sleep, sleep will decrease or increase respectively one's breathing rate and consequently their physiological symptoms of stress because that was the um the, the principle of the synchronization like we said so here you can see a diagram of uh, the each of the different cuffs uh, sequentially uh heating up and changing 
So we in, in this study, we had uh, participants, like these were MIT students, uh, in a control and sort of on a fast group wearing the sleeve, but with different haptic feedback rhythm. So a uh, group could have a slower, slow feedback rhythm based on the um, uh, in response to the breathing rate and one a faster. Um, uh, and so we had these participants in um, the groups taking the stressful quiz and see if they could uh, increase or decrease their breathing rate. And so I aligned uh, and their symptoms of stress, right? So I aligned with their hypothesis, participants in the fast group that had the sleep, that had the faster rhythm of um, haptic action, um, they had an increase in the breathing rate and that they also had an increase in their skin conductance, which is also an indication of stress, uh, which is like the sweat, how, like how much your, your skin is sweating, basically. And participants in the group that was wearing the sleeve that was more uh, slow paced, they also reported having more relaxing experience and uh, were more willing to wear the sleeve in their everyday lives. Um, and so as a continuation of, of this research, I thought to uh, design a second uh, sleeve. And this time I wanted to, to, to kind of incorporate like deep pressure stimulation because that has been proven to be more beneficial uh, as opposed to light touch for um, anxiety and these sort of disorders. So um, I again use the same design of having different cuffs. And for me, the design there was the, the challenge was how to um, make each of the inflatable, this is an inflatable nylon fabric, um, um, the heat sealed, was how to uh, create the activation without the sleeve ballooning, right? And so it was uh, actually a challenging task and it, the design is patent pending now. And, and so I did a, a, another study, this time I had like a greater group of participants, um, which were unfortunately uh, uh, not equally numbered because of uh, COVID, we had some missing, but uh, the hypothesis was again the same, that I wanted to test uh, whether like a higher pace uh, of, of, of haptic action will increase breathing rate and um, kind of arousal levels and kind of subjective feelings of that and, and the opposite with a slow pace. But I also um, tested a variety of, of conditions. I wanted to see which one is more effective when it's sequential, where it's all the sleep together, when it's heat only, when it's pressure only, and kind of create a repertoire of material sensations that could be useful for for me and for other designers and researchers on kind of on to create like wearables like that for for health and for um commu effective communication. So the second study didn't have like a stressful uh, test. Instead, I had a UI with sliders having the participants to experience all these conditions in randomized sequence and evaluate them. And the results were uh, even more um, exciting than before, because as you can see that the green lines at bar, so the increase in breathing rate in the fast group um, and the uh, compared to uh, the baseline and the, the blue, the decrease in the slow group um, compared to the baseline. So basically, uh, aligned to the hypothesis, there was a positive correlation between the rhythm of have action of the sleeve and the breathing rate of the participant, uh, which means that um, there, the, this idea of the synchronization, right, it, it kind of, uh, it was actually, it happened. Unfortunately, I didn't have statistical significance due to miss, missing of some of participants uh, to, to COVID times. But the other thing was also interesting was uh, through the self-reports of participants after the study, I this is uh, based on the affective sphere complex, like it's a method used by psychologists and, and Russell um, to measure effect. Uh, I kind of used my, uh, based my reports on, on that, but I gave sliders to participants um, like to measure how much excitement, how much tiredness and so on in a way that can be redundant, redundant um, because they would answer both positive and negative at the same time. Um, and I get this more refined uh, results in terms of each condition, the kind of like an affective map uh, based on like how they felt at a specific time, uh, the specific condition. And so this service is based on two dimensions of one activation and one pleasure and all affective states are, supposed to kind of fall in these uh, two dimensions. Um, and so what is, and then um, 
I superimposed all the results of participants one on top of the other for each condition, right? And I get like a more collective map. And what was very interesting for me to see is that visually, you can see that visually, and that's what's interesting when architects and things uh, mess with uh, things like that is that we know how to represent things in interesting ways. Um, in, in the slow group, uh, we see that all the effective maps gravitate towards the bottom right, which means like people were more tired and but more also more calm, which is uh, makes sense because there was less arousal. Um, re in the regular group, um, they were kind of symmetric, the results, which is they had a more neutral response. And in the fast group, it was more um, up and right, which is more excitement, which is also aligned with the, the idea that the, the, the sleep was more energizing, more exciting. Um, so, so what am I doing with, with that and why is it useful? Um, so, uh, so this could have interesting application in different areas. And actually now at NYT, I started to collaborate with a faculty in occupational therapy, uh, Alexander Lopez to, um, to investigate how we can uh, see applications of that in individuals with autism. Um, so individual autism may be hypostimulated or hyperstimulated. Um, and so something like that could help kind of regulate their arousal levels. Um, and so, and, and the fact that it uses haptic feedback is also very useful. So coming back to the idea of haptic feedback for uh, autism, the first to introduce uh, something like that was Temple Grandin, uh, one of the most famous advocates for um, individuals with autism and uh, having autism herself also. She introduced the squeeze machine in 1965, which is like this huge box uh, with two plates um, that um, kind of squeeze you um, voluntarily. And that squeezing for her was very kind of uh, relaxing, very soothing. And there were many reproductions of this machine and, and like in different forms. Um, and, um, and then there were like uh, weighted jackets and other type of equipment. But so um, none of these usually are uh, wearable, mobile and customized in a way that address individual needs and uh, kind of integrate it uh, to, to clothing, for example, what's, what could be an idea. Um, so now we're, we're investigating, our question would be, can this affect the sleeve of a customized and integrated a mobile uh, emotion regulation treatment to those individuals? Could they just wear this and go home or go to work instead of having uh, to, to play the, like jump on the trampoline in the occupational therapy center or, getting this big, a big, huge wooden squeezing machine. Um, so with that, I want to continue with um, some of the education, um, some of the pedagogy, pedagogical methods uh, towards inclusive design. And one of the principles I've been using my, my work is to um, design for all the senses. So architecture has been, um, it's to great ex extent, ocular centric. We pri prioritize the eye at the expense of the other senses often. And that is um, maybe uh, with negative sequences with, uh, for individuals who don't have, uh, who have visual impairments or who have sensory sensibilities. So um, I've been inspired a lot by Maria Montessori's, um, the Montessori method and the sensory training methods she, she used and introduced in the 90, in the beginning of the 20th century. So he, see, here you can see, for example, students being uh, blindfolded while having didactic material to train the sense of touch. And so kind of her position was focusing on each of the senses individually will help refine those senses and having these refined sensations will have a, a refined appreciation of the world. Um, these ideas also uh, were introduced at the a Bauhaus school, which I believe everyone here knows. Uh, and here, for example, Asra Moholinaz introduced the tactile training to students in the first semester and having them do kind of charts and uh, products to not like design buildings or design, but to, to allow them to get aware, be aware of the sensations, to train the sensations in order to, to build more sensitive to the senses design environments. And so um, kind of, introducing the technology to kind of seeing again this kind of Montessori aspect uh, of, of the senses through computation. Um, I, for a project, I, uh, earlier project I did, I developed these wearables and asked people to wear them. Um, this is in front of Sarin and Chapel at MIT. 
ask people to wear them uh, and walk around uh, spaces like important architecture uh, spaces and others and kind of have an uh, like a digital imprint of this kind of body trajectory but more important uh, making them aware of sensory aspects of the environment and how I did that is I created this little experiment by asking people to uh, use this wearable and that this wearable was a creature of a, some other kind that had only one sense um, and to to go explore the space uh, in the only sense that creature has available. So what happened is that the students were going around and touching things and knocking them with their um, hands or like shouting and running around the building, kind of engaging with affordances of objects that otherwise we don't. So this is in the, for example, the upper uh, pictures for the altar of the, of Sarina Chapel, uh, the sculpture, which by engaging with the hands, we kind of also hear how it sounds. We 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 understand how it, how the tactile qualities, right? And also by doing that, you become aware of qualities of the environment. So this other space down there, um, they would knock the columns to understand. Oh, they're fake because they're plaster. And um and and it's so this was a little experiment that I thought could be in some ways uh, introduced uh, in, in kind of in education, a kind of proof of concept on why it's important to do that. Um, this has um, kind of served also as a background for uh, teaching studios. So this is in collaboration with uh, the Perkins School of the Blind. Um, we This is the, the, in the middle is Perkins uh, president, David Power, and me and my uh, co-instructor um, and uh, our students. And so we went at uh, Perkins, it's an amazing building because it's designed, uh, this is in uh, Watertown in Massachusetts. It's designed particularly for blind people and it's the sound is so important in all the senses. Like it's, it's amazing, I hadn't been in any uh, building before so well designed for all the senses. Um, so, the, for example, to orient in the different corridors uh, by the different uh, height of the ceiling, they understand through the echo. They even have a particular way they arrange their flowers to, so they can guide students through the smell outside in the garden and so on. So we ask students there to uh, develop uh, interface products uh, or environments that can help uh, blind people uh, kind of navigate the world or enhance their experience in, in different ways. Um, another uh, principle um, I've been using is the design for the atypical user. Um, so that um, in architecture, again, we we tend uh, when we design and in education to kind of imagine like a typical user. Maybe sometimes we protect ourselves uh, in kind of the user of the building, or we assume certain measurement and metrics that they will be given to us in and kind of throughout history of architecture, but. Um, this typical measurement and the typical user excludes all those that are typical, that have their typical body, that have uh, sensory, uh, physical disabilities, uh, or kind of mobility uh, issues. So the typical user, and this is the uh, first time I introduced that in uh, Wentworth, uh, I thought that I taught um, last year. Um, I, I, I've been asking students to kind of create these scenarios of um, an atypical user and how they experience the world, and then um, create um, respond to this by uh, designing a certain intervention. So these were for students that had no computation technology background whatsoever, uh, instead of like the classic CAD tools. And they so, for example, this student team created this communication system using Arduino and sensors for. Um, uh, a user that has all um, selective mutism, which is basically when you get stressed, you cannot uh, speak. And so that was a haptic communication system between uh, partners or family to kind of um, communicate in, in, in times of stress. And, and so, um, well, currently, um, what we're teaching now at uh, NYT is uh, a studio called a Typical Architectures. Uh, designing for university, neurodiversity and inclusion. This I'm teaching with uh, Professor Pongratz, and we collaborate with uh, Professor Lopez from Occupational Therapy at NYT. And it's, I mean, uh, for me, it's great we have all these uh, schools of health professions because uh, collaborations are very important uh, when we try to do uh, projects like that, right? And doing my research before at MIT, I did have, of course, I had advisors in my um, 
committee that were from psychology or affected computing and so on. But now as a as a faculty is a collaboration is uh, is a different. Um, and so um, for in this class, we, uh, it's interesting that we we started by actually uh, making the students aware of what is to to kind of to be aware of their environments and the affective aspects of, of every day of their everyday lives because we realize that we don't have like we don't have uh, tools to talk about this usually in architecture people uh, like we're not as sensitive so here you can see the same affective state complex i used uh, before in my research but we gave this to students and told them like pick an activity of your everyday life like going to the office or something or taking your dog for a walk and try to um map out the different affective states in this trajectory kind of try to be sensitive to um to these qualities so they made this uh, overlay diagrams and um we also uh gave them a sensors uh to um kind of uh to, to be more aware of their physiological uh, aspects. So this kind of interceptive awareness. So here it was a, a project about one of the students described her, her day at work and she had an architecture project that was stressful and so on. And we, she was wearing this breathing sensor and you can see like when the breathing is more, um, you know, more frequent than it's uh, at the time when she was more stressed because of a deadline. And, um, and so then as a next step, uh, we actually, uh, I want to go here. In the next step, we actually ask them to uh, think of a persona that has, um, uh, that is in the autism spectrum. And um, I kind of revisit this experience, uh, this kind of, through this imaginary persona um, that has, after doing some readings and try to see, how, project, like how would they feel different than you? Um, and also we tried to create awareness by here, our uh, professor Lopez from the occupational therapy, he brought to us all this equipment, right? Uh, so these are not VR goggles. These are not uh, extended reality goggles. These are simple plastic goggles that have a sticker in the middle. And the idea was to make students exposed in the idea of disability. So here in this case of uh, limited uh, vision, like a visual impairment. And we had students like uh, do activities and tasks uh, by like through the eyes of of this uh, limited limitation, and uh, by that like really having them experience this in a situated manner. So at the, in the current phase, like as we speak, actually our students are in the inclusive sports and fitness um, in Long Island. So that's the uh, nonprofit organization of uh, Professor Lopez. Um, here are our students and Professor Progress in the back, and we we bring them there and we have them exposed to these machines and uh, training. So in, in this nonprofit, uh, actually, the idea is to um, help uh, individuals with autism to overcome their disabilities through athletic training. So many of these kids go to uh, become very good athletes. And but but at the same time, through this training, they become more smart. They overcome their sensitivities, the stress, and other symptoms of the uh, disorder. And so um, here you can see our students trying the equipment of the of this uh, facility. And these are some of the machines that were invented actually by um, uh, Professor Lopez. And um, I was I've been very um, kind of got very fascinated with something that. Um, uh, you know, uh, Professor Lopez said that he said like, and he works, he says all the time that he's, you know, many students go, uh, many families bring their kids there and they, they think they don't have, they, they think they don't have potentials or they, 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 the kids themselves think like they, they um, that they cannot do much. But like the more they get exposed to more, uh, more, um, challenges and sensory uh, stimulation and uh, kind of new activities, the more they become enabled to do more things. And in the end, um, they have the dramatic uh, improvement. So he says that like what he, the, he thinks that um, it is not the person who is disabled. He, he said it's the environment that disables. So basically uh, that it's the social environment uh, or like the conditions that a person is uh, exposed to. But I also do that here is the, physical environment and um, the design environment. And we are architects and design researchers. And I think it's our 
duty to um, design more enabling environments. Um, okay, uh, I guess with that, I'm, I'm happy to open it to discussion. So thank you very much, Athena, because um, I, I, I'm, I, I have been writing down a lot of things. Oh, great, to, thank to, you. To try to, 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 to have more information. No? Uh, from my point of view, I think that this idea of a self-assembly lab and, and how you are um, producing your, your own materials, you know, how to create materials, it's something amazing for one architect or one designer. And, and also this point of uh, this relationship between psychological and physiological and, and materiality, you know, uh, from my point of view, is something amazing. Well, we have um, some, I, I think, some questions that um, Eduardo, if you want to, to tell us, Thank you, Ignacy. Uh, hello, Atina. Hi. I want to ask you uh, about two things. Uh, the first is about if you consider uh, 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 if this innovation, this research can be applied in architectural materials. And, and the another question is the possibility to, to use this haptic rhythm in floor beatings or furniture like chairs uh, and other um, environmental architecture things uh, that beating like the, the that this research that that you show us yes um i, I, I want to clarify for the first question you asked me materials um you mean building materials because i i sold materials so are you in yeah so um the idea is uh, that, in principle, any kind of rhythmic environment can uh, act therapeutically in this way by correlating to our rhythms. So it could be a rhythmic light, or as you said very nicely, like a, a, a chair or a vibrating um, floor. Like uh, there could be different ways to implement this in different uh, environments and products. Of course, when you go out up up in scale, right? you're thinking okay you don't want maybe to have a vibrating wall or the whole building vibrating so how, what are some strategies that you can do to scale up i was thinking maybe light or sound is something that's more scalable um but um it's definitely something that you uh it's not limited to to a sleeve and i, and I said like this was for me a case study to explore because in a way it was easier to make something a wearable and test it with different participants. But certainly, uh, and I, I have a nice slide, but I don't have it here. I guess I saw different products, like from a pillow to a garment to, to shoes to that they can connect with you. Um, and actually, uh, the idea could be that you have, and, and I, I founded um, the startup actually to investigate this uh, as an application that you could have this. Um, um, in, the, in this kind of Internet of Things world, so you can have a product, or, or which can be a, a garment, like a sleeve, or like a, um, a pillow, or a chair, as you said. And you can have it connected in your iPhone in, in some uh, um, interface, custom interface. And in fact, I'm working in this interface to be able to customize based on your needs, or even to communicate with others um, non-verbally and have this material okay. respond. And so this is basically you you're you you're ahead. It's like what 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 I want to do in the future is expand this system and what I'm uh, yeah looking to to do right now. I don't know in what with one extent it would be towards buildings or products, uh, but um, I, I think it's more approachable in products right now. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Tina. If you could say some website to visit or learn more about this, este, you can say yes, please. Uh, yes, I um I, I will I will share it once once I have more um 
more uh you know development on, on that <laughs> right now it's all under development you know not published yet but but well athena i something that i i i, I believe is that i'm in front of the next billionaire in the world because you you are solving something as 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 typical as the stress you know so an stress solution for any of us would be something uh, amazing no so how we could make a, a shirt a jersey some a jacket whatever that can have this this uh, garment that or, or this application that that we could control our our state or our behavior in this sense no so um i, I think um, you you are uh, approaching something that that it can have uh, multiple solutions and applications uh in all the world no? all of us we are suffering about stress or or i do not know the the numbers about autism no but uh, i have some friends with with some kids with affected by autism or, or with this dysfunctionality and and well mm, if you know that something like this could to, could help uh the situation mm, a lot of people would like to to invest on that yeah. hopefully and uh, and and here i think the difference is like you see uh i agree agree and i, I hope to um you know uh, see this also. I see this also as a business opportunity. Um, but um, the difference we see today many wearables, right? Many smartwatches, like there's everywhere. But what they usually do is they they give you metrics. So they 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 take your you can so make you aware of your heart rate or like measurement of your like sleep. But like um, they, so there's now there start to be a new generation of, of wearables that uh, actually do something. They they provide feedback, and these are in a very new sta sta stage. There are not many products like that uh, out, out outside in the world. So and and I think as uh, yeah, designers we have an advantage on how to design these systems because we see the details of the design and we are more sensitive in you know uh, something that can be. Um, not just engineered, but also kind of could be a fashion. For example, our eyewear, like we wear glasses, that's a disability, right? But we make glasses that are fashionable and nice and elegant. And uh, our quote health devices should also be part of our fashion, our design, and our, uh, you know, in our design template. So I think, yes, I agree. And I, I'm very happy you. <laughs> <laughs> You 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 like this approach? <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. I'm a follower of Akim Menges' uh, work in in Stuttgart in the uh, Lightweight Structures Institute there, and and he's making some approach, but it's more about the materials and the behavior of of nature of the materials, yeah. no? but not this relation with with something that is. Uh, I would say more interesting in the fact that it's affecting us, no? not only the shape of one building or the shape or because there is more humidity, etc. No, but but something that is, I think, is um, uh, really more powerful when it's affecting us directly, no, and our mood. Let's say uh, when, when we are working, um, relaxing, resting being concentrated etc no i can imagine uh this uh being applied in libraries no in 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 a place that that you need to to change and and to relax in a in a very good way no? so it has been really interesting we have to stop here because we have another presentation right now so athena thank you very much i do not know eduardo if you wanted to add something more no just uh, agree and, and thanks to Athena and Ignacy for this this is spectacular this is a big place and uh, thank you to Natalia too. Okay, thank you, thank you all so much. I was honored to be here. Before, before 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 you go, um, yeah. I wanted to thank you and you're representing the New York Institute of Technology today. 
Um, they are our sponsors as well. And I'd like to emphasize the importance to see the work of um, other um, uh, professionals that are doing and, and, and gives us idea of how to create better projects and how to think in a different way. Because projects like these ones, as I saw yours, um, you know, open our mind to new methods of, of um, embracing the problems that we have today. And architects are uh, interested in improving uh, the life of people uh, with the building. And, you know, the type of product you're um, creating, it could be, um, you know, somehow implemented. Uh, we don't know yet, but if you open your mind, if we're thinking about um, the, um, the well-being of people in a space, we can also consider that, you know, clothing uh, could, um, you know, be implemented uh, eventually. You know, we, we have rooftop here in New York where you go and they give you a blanket when you go uh, because it's, it's cold outside of the rooftop in the winter. And it's kind of a garment that um, is, uh, is part of the experience of the space. So um, the same way we have that type of experience, we can get other type of experiences. And, um, you know, interior designers can also consider products like yours. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your research. Thank you. Thank you so much.